Hello, I'm here, Rebecca. This is Tenja. Hey, Tenja. Um, I'm sorry, my call, my call dropped. Are we all back on together? Yes, yes, we're on. You are on right now, okay? Oh, awesome, awesome. Hey, everybody, I'm so sorry. I have to, I got to be honest, like, I feel like I'm, some days you're the fly and some days you're the windshield. And uh, yesterday it, I was with a thousand people in Nashville and the same thing happened. No, it no worries at all, Rebecca. Sometimes these things happen. So let me go ahead and welcome you, read off your bio, and I'm going to let you take it away. Right on, Tanja. I got you. Let's go. All right. Welcome again, everyone. We're happy to have you here today for this webinar on From Fearful to Fearless, Mobilizing Your Community Boldly Towards Its Future with our special guest, Rebecca Ryan, author and founder and owner of Next Generation Consulting, Inc. Before I turn the program over, we have a few housekeeping notes. Please remember, place your phone on mute and refrain from placing the call on hold because we could possibly receive um, unnecessary background noise and interruptions. Second, we have reserved time for questions at the end of this webinar. If you have any questions, please ask them using the question function in the webinar access panel. The question box is in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Just type in your questions and we will read them aloud. Third, this webinar will be recorded and the link will be emailed to everyone. Let's welcome our speaker. Rebecca Ryan is the author of The Next Big Things, The Next 20 Years in Local Government, Regeneration, a Manifesto for America's Future Leaders, and Live First, Work Second, Getting Inside the Head of the Next Generation. Described as a human spark plug, she is the founder and owner of Next Generation Consulting, Inc., the resident futurist at the Alliance for Innovation and resident futurist at the Local Government Institute of Wisconsin the chairperson of the board and a faculty member for the Institute of, for Zen Leadership and the founder of Futurist Camp. Rebecca has degrees in economics and international relations from Drake University and a professional certificate in strategic foresight from the University of Houston. And now, Rebecca Ryan. Thank you so much, Tanja, and it is wonderful to be with all of you today. Um, I think in light of my def technical difficulties here with the webinar, I am not even going to try to start my webcam, although I did put on a fresh shirt and lipstick for this. So I'm going to have to just enjoy that for myself. Um, you guys will have to use your imagination. It's wonderful to be with you again. Uh, I love my ACCE people. At the beginning of every day, I always pick a highlight for the day, and today's was our hour together. So um, I want to I wanna walk you through a couple things. First of all, there is some bonus material. So some of you may know that after the ACCE conference this year, I wrote up um, my session on how to slay your fear. This is kind of a VIP only session, but I wrote it up and I sent it to our newsletter subscribers in a very generalized format. But what you're seeing here is the ACCE version. I wrote a special version only for chamber executives and um, we will make sure that you get the full PDF available delivered to your inbox and it's a privilege to be able to share that with you so these two hacks that I talk about in this newsletter we may get to both of them today um, but there are some other things that I want to share with you today about moving your community from fear to fearlessness um, also I just want to remind you that anytime maybe not today because today we're going to do the Q&A through the chat box that Tenja mentioned but you can always text me a question if you have a question about what's going on. I'm available to you. This is my bat phone. It rings right into my pocket. Um, so you, you've got that. And I'll, I'll show this again before um, it's all over. But um, I care about the work that our chambers do. I feel like for many reasons, we'll talk about some of them, uh, chambers are in a pole position to lead their communities from fear to fearlessness. So don't hesitate to text me. Um, if you've got something that you want to you want to text or talk about um, and then the next thing is we're going to use something new today we're going to run an experiment um, I'm going to encourage you right now don't maybe close this browser if you're looking at this on your like on your laptop at work or on your desktop system at work maybe open another browser window or you can do this on your phone too go to any you know um, web browser and type in you can see it there www.pollev.com forward slash A-C-C-E, and when you go to that page, you're going to see on the right there is kind of what you're going to see. Um, we're going to do a couple of polls, because I want to get a sense of who's on the call, what your alertness is, and so forth, and you're going to see my screen, kind of the behind the scenes of this, uh, while I'm doing it, okay? So again, 
point a browser either you know on any device. Could be your smartphone, could be a laptop, could be a desktop, could be an iPad. Any device, just shoot it to that www.pollev.com slash acce. The first poll is open. And now I'm going to kind of take you behind the scenes. So you get to see what it looks like behind the scenes. So here it is. We're going to load it up. And I know that I think there's already one vote in there. 21 of you have already voted. Jeez Louise. Okay, so again, <laughs> I love that one person who was like, oh, my God, please pass me the ibuprofen at the bottom there. Um, I know how these chamber people roll. So you guys are taken to this like a duck to water. But for those of you who aren't following it completely, um, again, pollev.com slash A-C-C-E. And you can easily, it's very intuitive, just vote. And then you can see the real-time data pouring in up here. Um, I'm going to give just a few more seconds. I kind of want you to have the hang of this uh, as we go through the webinar. because so this is going to be a really nice way for you guys to give me feedback, um, you know, barring, barring our ability to really talk to each other. So I think we're still with that one person who's like, whew, you must have been entertaining some economic development clients last night. Something's going on there. So holy smokes, a lot of you are fully afternoon caffeinated, 62%. That's chamber, folks, for you right there. All in, 100%. I love it. All right. Let's see about going to the next poll here. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Hang on. You know what happened? I didn't activate this one yet, so let me just activate it. Boom. And now... Well, did I activate it? Yeah, there it is. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Sweet. We got the Carolinas in the house. We got Iowa, Texas. Look at you guys. Everywhere, coast to coast. I have a feeling it's that one person in California who had a late night last night. Like, even now, it's like, you know this is still morning, right? You know that this is, I just finished breakfast. Um, this is fantastic. I'll be honest, this is the first time I've done the mapping, and I'm thrilled to see how it's working. 100% awesome. Thank you, guys. I'm going to leave this on here for just a minute. Did I just see somebody move their state? Oh, never mind. I used to work in that community. Now I work in this community over here. Um, oh, I see some of you guys are just messing around. You can change your vote. So um, good to know. It's wonderful to see um, such a nice cross-section of folks logging in. I think, Tenja, we can also see where multiple people are calling in from one location. This is awesome. So, um, and, you know, this this polling stuff is fantastic. I really strongly encourage you to use it at your annual meetings. It can be a little pricey, but you can, for polleverywhere.com, you can drop in or out at any time. I am not endorsed to say that, but this is the technology I use when I'm doing remotes, um, and they've come a long way uh, with how effective it is. So, um, thank you guys for being good sports about all this. Now, as you know, the topic that we're talking about today is fear. So I want to ask a question about, you know, where the fear is coming from um, in your community. So this is going to be the third question. Um, and, and let me just start by saying that, you know, all communities have some stuff written into their DNA. Um, so, you know, when you think about what scares your folks, right? Um, this is open-ended. You can type in anything that you want. Um, activate. There we go. Um, what, what are people in your community afraid of or worried about? just want to get a, a little bit of a sense of this because this will help me um, kind of gear my remarks around some of the real things. So... As you're loading up your answers there, um, taking just a minute for you guys to thumb type these in on your devices, absolutely understandable. I'm going to actually minimize this screen just a little bit so that I can put that off to the side. So you can keep this question. Um, not activated? I cannot tell. Yep, there we go. Come on, baby. That's 
not what I wanted to see. All right, well, maybe this poll is not totally working. So, um, and it could be operator error. Let's just be honest about that. So um, for this one, why don't we do this? Why don't you jump over to your chat box? And if you're willing to publish, um, you know, your your what your community is afraid of. And as, as you do that, I... I want to talk a little bit about, you know, why are we talking about fear? You know, why, why do I want to do this talk with you guys about fear? As you know, I'm a futurist, right? And I'm an economist. And so I try to help people go from one condition in their community to another condition in the community, from what's working now to what might work in the future. And the, the truth of human beings is that we don't like to change. I mean, we all know that. But change, you know, it sets off a fear response for many of us. So it's completely normal um, for communities to have fear, for, for individuals within communities to have fear. And, you know, some of the other truths about fear is that, you know, fear is contagious. So there's a lot of social science now and psychological research that shows that fear can spread around a community. Fear is literally contagious. So it makes sense for us as leaders within our communities, as influencers within our community, and um, hopefully as pace setters and change makers within our communities to be able to moderate and modulate our own levels of fear. Um, for those of you who are who are CEOs or who are in the C-suite, you know, you I hope you know that your attitude is contagious. So fear is contagious, positivity is contagious, engagement is contagious, smiling is contagious. Um, in the bonus material that we'll send out after this, I'm going to send you a very short five-minute um, gross science video on what we now know about fear being contagious and uh, I think you'll you'll in, you'll enjoy the video it's something you can certainly share with your compatriots but the bottom line in this is that um, fear is contagious and fear keeps people stuck have you ever noticed that uh, you know that you need to make a change in your life, but making the change feels more difficult than just staying with the status quo. There's something about making making the change, going from one condition, from X to Y, that makes us fearful, and it therefore keeps us stuck. So from my perspective as a futurist, you know, what I'm trying to help you guys do is get to bigger, more ambitious futures, and I can't do that if there's a predominant amount of fear in the culture or fear in the society because fear not only is contagious, but it keeps us stuck. And then the final thing about fear that I notice, and it's related to these two, but it's it centers on this notion that hanging on is hard. You know, I, I did this activity with a bunch of MBA students at the University of Wisconsin on Monday. I had them clench their fists as hard as they possibly could. In fact, I'm doing it right now. You can probably hear it in my voice. I'm clenching my fists. Maybe do it yourself. Make a fist as hard, as hard, as hard as you can. And what you're going to notice is that your knuckles might start to turn white, parts of your hands start to turn red. My arm is literally shaking a bit right now, right? Hanging on is, a, is something that is not easy, right? But now release. Release that hand. Blood starts to come back into the fingers, right? There's a little bit of tightness maybe, but wow, that feels a lot better. And if you are in a community that is trying to grasp tightly to its past, if you're in a community where people think their best days are behind it, not ahead of it, you're living in a fear-based community. You know, people who want to go back to the way it was. All of those are manifestations of fear. And as your futurist in residence for this next while, I want you to know that if there's one dragon that we have to slay to get to bigger futures, it's fear. So the reason I talk about fear in leaders and I talk about fear in communities and often when I'm on site with you, I will ask, What's your community really afraid of? You know, if I feel like we're hitting that wall of resistance, like what's really going on here? What are people really afraid of? This is where the magic is. This is the, the depth that we have to go to to kind of get the change that we believe is really possible. So um, I want to tell you a real quick story 
about this in my own life. Some of you know this, many of you don't. But um, in 2014, my brother Ron, who uh, was 50 at the time, uh, and he was my uh, older brother, my adopted, we were both adopted from different families, very much a created family. I was raised in a created family. Um, he died of a heart attack. And it was very uh, unexpected. And he was my only sibling. And our father had already passed away. And um, because he had a learning disability, he operated at about a seventh grade level. You know, we had a relationship where I was really his protector. Uh, even though I was younger than him, eight years younger than him, I really felt like I was his protector. And I think it's why even to this day I sort of have a, um, you know, I, I root for the underdog. I try to watch out for the underdog. So anyway, Ron passes away. Very shocking. And then six weeks later, my partner at the time, we've been together for 10 years, partners in work and in life, um, told me that they wanted a divorce. And so within six weeks' time, I lost my brother. I lost my partner. And I went into a pretty significant depression um, and pretty significant life change. And everything that I thought was stable in my life, my family, my, you know, my brother, my partner, my, my family, my business, everything felt like it was just, in, you know, unstable. There was just not a sense that things were, were stacking up. And, um, you know, when you're in those moments of instability, that's when all your fears come come rushing to the fore. When we're on the left side of this, you know, when things feel relatively stable, um, you know, we we kind of can feel at our best. But boy, when you get a bunch of instability in your life, um, things feel super whopper jawed. Things don't feel stable, and that is really when a lot of the fear can come out. You know, I. I use that very personal example because uh, I think a lot of you can probably relate to it. You know, somebody you know and love gets a cancer diagnosis or somebody you know and love loses their home or somebody you know and love, good gracious, if you have a kid who's hurting themselves or, you know, um, just not making the grade or becomes addicted to a substance, you know this feeling of instability and it's when our fears, rational or not, really come to the fore. Now, you zoom that out onto a community level right? And you can see where this stuff gets writ large at a community level. Um, so I want to try to go back over here to poll everywhere and really, for, the, for real, make this one um, anonymous. What are you afraid of? So... Let's and Rebecca, see. sorry for the interruption. Yes. This is Kenja. Yeah. I just want to let you know yeah. that uh, we do have a few of those questions coming through. They're in the chat. So if for some reason they don't come through oh. in that poll, check that chat. And okay. you'll see that we have a whole lot of folks um, asking some questions. Rock on. Okay, great. I will jump back over that in just a minute. Let me see if I can. Thank you, guys. Okay, good. This one's working. Thank you. Thank you for that first person who jumped in there to confirm this is working. Um, I appreciate your honesty. We're going to let this populate for a little bit, and I really, really appreciate your candor in this because we all have these fears, and they are what prevent us often from moving forward, lack of buy-in, being wrong. Oh, man, climate change. Yep. Political rhetoric. Man, you guys are perfect talismans for what's happening in the in the general dialogue, what are you afraid of? Right. Good. Let's see if I can get to scroll down here. Socialism, growth that changes the personality of our community, lack of open mindedness, becoming irrelevant, imposter syndrome, negative politics, our president. Thank you guys for your honesty. Fires, drought, transportation. Oh man, you the, the person who wrote three lines, I'm coming over to give you a hug in just a minute. Elimination of the middle class. Yeah, I appreciate your candor here. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna toggle over now. Um and let's let's kind of get into it, right? Let's get into it. So we have our own fears that are very real and sometimes bring out our own boogeymen. And we've got a community that we're trying to lead, and that community 
you know, has its own fears. And together, it can just feel like a hot mess, right? But I want to normalize some of this for you. So it is totally normal to feel fear. Um, those of you who know, you know, who've heard me talk about the fast and the slow brain, you know, Dan Kahneman's work, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, and I'll send out a, pod, a great podcast about our, how our brains work, but fear is deeply embedded in us and it's very useful because fear helps keep us alive. That fight or flight um, or freeze, that is embedded in us and it is designed to help us stay alive. When it's not useful is when it just takes over in some of these other ways. So the fear that you are internalizing yourself the, feel, the fear that you feel on behalf of your community is absolutely normal. You know, you know that I talk about this all the time, that we go through this every four-season cycle of winter, right? And in this time of winter, things that were very, very stable, certain, simple, and clear turn into something else entirely, what the military calls VUCA, right? This acronym for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And when you're living on this right side of this slide, when you're living in VUCA, um, it is just riddled with fear. It's very, I mean, you have to be some kind of Zen master to keep a calm center core when you're in a VUCA world. You know, this is why the military trains like it does. But another thing that the military does is they train in foresight. You know, they use some tools from futuring that are very, very useful to help them navigate. So I'm not going to belabor this next bit because so many of you are familiar with my last book, you know my work, but this idea that America is seasonal and we go through a spring, summer, fall, winter cycle. Our last spring was right after World War II. This is when baby boomers were born. Baby boomers grew up during summer. Summer was a time that was somewhat volatile. You know, we had boomers asking their parents, and grandparents, you know, why do we throw our waste in our rivers and streams at the environmental movement start? We had the women's movement start. The civil rights movement kind of restarted. Um, you know, this was a very tumultuous time uh, in our country. Gen Xers born during summer. Gen Xers grew up during fall. Fall was a time when a lot of our big-time institutions started to show signs of crumbling and cracking. You know, from the institution of marriage to the uh, SNL loan crisis, um, to the um, you know the shuttle Challenger explosion and and um, uh, the Iran Contra scandal, it was a time when our questions about who could we trust, you know, really started to 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 falter. Millennials are born during fall, so millennials grew up during winter. Started in 2001 with the with 9/11, estimated to go until about 2020 or 2021. Each of these seasons, you'll notice, is about a generation in length. And so here we are in winter. And so is it any wonder that people are fearful? You know, the, it's, it's like God's little trick on us is that our meat suits, our bodies, don't live long enough to go through more than one of these spring, summer, fall, winter cycles. So we've been through three others. This is our fourth winter. Um, and this is kind of the emotional landscape of how this all plays out. So um, from a hope to fear, we to me, you know, hope, um, is spring and summer, things feel really hopeful, and then we start to fall into fear during fall, and then by winter it's like, woo, we are clearly in fear. Um, you know, that fear me corner, that lower left-hand corner, you know, this is, you know, we're not at our best when we're in this corner. We're afraid of a lot of things, and we're very focused on ourselves. And uh, you, so this, you can understand, that the example I like to use is you can kind of understand how somebody would feel that they were justified, you know, shooting somebody on their front lawn. You know, somebody's encroaching on your territory and you feel afraid, right? Whereas we start to make the turn into hope and we get a little less fearful and a little more hopeful that better days are to come. And then around and around we go this four season cycle. So here we are towards the end of winter right now. And some of your communities are clearly in spring, you know, you're already there. Some of you feel like, yeah, we're kind of in spring, but we still have a few chunks of, of ice that need to fall off during winter. But th the point of sharing this graph with you is how understandable it is that people in your community are afraid. I want to tell you a real quick story about how fear can live in a community. 
I was working out in a community in New York, and you know you know how this is because you've done this with your consultants, right? You give your consultant the windshield tour of your community, and you take them to the, the you know, the business park, and you take them to the uh, entrepreneurial incubator, and you take them to your newly gentrifying part of town, and you, you go to Soto and Lodo and Sobro, and you know you, you take them all over. Um, and there was this one, this community I was visiting in in New York. My tour guide, who was the head of community and economic development, she kept talking about the flood, the flood, the flood. And I thought, my God, you know, like, I don't know what she's talking about. Because we usually do research on communities before we go. We have a sense of what the issues are. And I, I finally said, you have to forgive me. Like, I do not know when this flood was. And she, and this was, this was in the 2000s that we were in the car visiting. And she said, oh, that was, it was in 19... 78 or something like this it's like over over 30 years ago and I thought to myself holy smokes that event had left such a scar on this community that they were still talking about rebounding from a flood that was 30 years ago I mean I think about my friends in the, in the Carolinas right now you're having a hurricane every week you know more regularly it seems now than ever before to think that that would ever make you stuck you know, nothing would ever get done if, if a significant weather event slowed your roll. But here, this flood that had happened all those years ago, it was something they were still scarred by. So when you think about, you know, your communities, what are your communities afraid of? You know, what are they worried about? I'm going to leave my cell phone number up here while I just real quickly um, text, look over at your text messages about this. So people are afraid of workforce, coastal erosion not having control of the changes, concerned about political fragmentation, hey Kelly, fear of losing identity and autonomy, cost of living. Yeah, with that underlying issue, Chris, this is such a good uh, insight. We talk about cost of living, but the underlying issue is fear that our kids aren't going to be able to come back to their community. That's such a good insight because beneath a lot of the rhetoric that we talk about is the true fear. You know, we say it's about affordable housing or we say it's about career pathway, but the real fear does tend to be much more deeply rooted into folks. Thank you guys for those questions. So I want to share with you two tools that you can use tomorrow, next month, in your communities. So I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about communities here, and then I'm going to give you a, a, a hack or two that you can use personally. But I want to give you two tools that your community can begin to use immediately to get that fear out in the open. And and that's really, you know, I don't talk about this a lot when I'm when I'm doing foresight in a community, but these tools are really designed to help eliminate fear. So many of you are familiar with the seven steps of foresight. All right, here they are. I know it looks like six steps, but if you pay close attention, three A and three B are divided into two steps. And um just a quick overview. You all know how to do steps four, five, and six. You guys all know how to cast visions. You know how to back cast or create milestones, and you know how to get stuff done. So four, five, and six, no magic to that. You're all familiar with it. Steps one through three B are the ones where the magic is from a futuring perspective, and I would also argue, and I hope you'll agree with me by the end of our webinar, from a fear slaying perspective. So let's zoom in, right? Um, steps two and steps three A and 3B are really where the fearlessness component comes in to communities. So here's how it works. I'm starting to be emboldened now. I think I'm going to turn my webcam right now. Okay, here we go. Share my webcam. Let's see. Here it comes. All right. You're welcome. Here's the lipstick. All right, so here's where this comes in. So step two here is where we scan for forces and trends. And what we're doing in this in this phase is a, a little bit of a ninja move. So you know that this happens in your communities where um, people's opinions, kind of the loudest mouth in the room, and whatever they're the most fear, fearful about or interested in hogs up the attention. And it can be your city council. It can be a big time philanthropist. It could be, you know, anybody with some power and influence. But they can really kind of hog up the mic, right? They can really put their opinion uh, of what's happening out there front and center. So in this step two of foresight, 
where you're actually doing a scan, and the, the ninja move here is to actually have this be a discussion in the community or have it be a workshop in the community or kind of use it as a, as a way to level set, is this step eliminates opinion and it grounds things in facts, right? And that's important because people can get real revved up about opinions um, but when when we really start to boil it down to facts, right, then we've got something we can really work with. Then we've got something we can really work around. Opinions tend to be highly emotional. Facts kind of bring that emotional level down just a little bit. So let me, I'm just going to look over to my other screen here so I can advance things. As some of you know, this is kind of the master recipe of the trends that we scan for, the steep trends. And, um, you know, and I, I picked a few that I think are, are germane for all of your communities. So the first one is this idea that, you know, if you're in North Carolina, who are you becoming? Right? How are you changing? Your demographics are drastically changing. Insert name of your state here. You know, you've got, you are likely changing. There is a new demographic wave, and that scares the crud out of Caucasians who are in power. They don't know how to share that power. They don't know how to think about how that would be different. And um, this is why a lot of the, um, the privilege training and the racial equity training is becoming so important um, within our communities and where chambers really have an opportunity to lead, right? What else are people wigged out about? Well, they're wigged out about the future of jobs. Will all of our jobs be roboticized? So uh, the World Economic Forum just came out with its Jobs for the Future report uh, at the end of September five things to know about the future of jobs. And yes, we will have more AI, we will have more robotics, more VR, right? But we will also have more than enough additional jobs. So to be able to have a real conversation about how automation and is going to change manufacturing, how automation is going to change the service industry, to, to root your economy in terms of the facts of what is most likely to happen is critical because what what has what has happened is that people have latched on to this you know there was a Guardian article out a few years ago that said up to 80 percent of all American jobs will be automated. Well, we as sort of the honest brokers in the community, we have to level set that, and that's where really looking at the trends with respect to the future of our jobs are going to be very helpful and putting this report in the packet of follow up so that you guys have good access to this material. It's a terrific, terrific report. And what I like about it is the ability to like crosswalk what your industries are, right, with where they see the automation coming. And then you've got a real perspective of um, where automation will and will not impact your economies. Right? Um, talk a little bit about, okay, so this is, I just want to point this out. See, this is from NATO. This is from NATO. It is unclassified. But you know I run around with these guys. Um, you know, they're a lot of futurists who work in the, in the military and so forth. So this is uh, section 4.21 of their most recent report on the future of technology and warfare. And I want you to pay attention to this. So China is kicking our butt. Um, the third bullet point there about Western countries, here's what this means. The ethics of the West are too high. NATO says that they cannot find Western companies to fulfill the warfare requirements of the future. So countries with poor ethics or no ethics are doing some things that are possibly going to kick our butts. But then check out the very bottom thing here about the GAFA company, com companies. Their influence on global power distribution is likely to increase. Right? These are some of the things that wise communities, right, we'll be paying attention to. So how do we, for example, with our social media feeds as chambers, feed into the fear and the frenzy versus moderate the fear and the frenzy? How do we use um, this data to drive a more meaningful discussion uh, around technology and its future, or political power and its future? Noah has reported, you know, kind of where climate and climate change is impacting. Texas has taken it the worst uh, since 1980 in terms of billion-dollar weather-related, um, you know, 
devastation disasters. And this, you know, what, what I love about this slide is, you know, picture tells a thousand words. So let's root our decision making in terms of real steep trends, not just people's opinions of, of what's happening. And then, you know, we we're fighting this in our communities. And many of you talked about it with tribalism. This is just a, um, a bubble map done by an artist who was trying to depict how we are talking less to each other across the blue and red spectrum and more to our own our own parties. And I could talk about this for a long, long time. It's one of the things I'm very interested in. But this to me, the fact that there's so little purple in the middle, that there's not a lot of red and blue talking with each other, this feels like one of the biggest opportunities for Chambers of Commerce. And I, I actually want to give um, David G. Brown a shout out on this because it was sitting around a policy table with his folks in, in Omaha when it occurred to me that because the left is moving further to the left and the right is moving further to the right, it is creating an even bigger kind of driveway for chambers to just drive through to be the honest brokers about issues that really matter. This is why, this is one of many reasons why I'm so bullish about chambers' ability to drive the discussion uh, in the future because this is happening. This slide, more reds talking to reds, more blues talking to blues, none of it amounts to a hill of beans because at the end of the day, we've got to be able to solve our problems together. So from my perspective, all of these things, how our society is changing, how our technology is changing, the changing face of our economy, the change, you know, how the environment is impacting us, our politics, all of those steep trends, if we can ground them in fact, and if the chamber can be the honest broker to bring that community discussion together, so what are we going to do about these facts? That is a huge opportunity for you. I think back to... Um, I don't know if Carl's on the call today, but Carl Blackstone in, in Columbia. Um, we, we hosted a conversation similar to this in Columbia, and the following Sunday, without Carl knowing it, the CBS, I think it was the CBS uh, news anchor, you know, publisher, got on, the, got on the TV and talked about how valuable it was for the community to talk together about these issues. Because everyone in your community is worried about these steep trends. And some of their worries are grounded in facts and some of them aren't. But this is an opportunity for you to slay that fear dragon, to take it out of opinion, take it into fact, and to host a conversation around what, how your community is going gonna, is gonna to deal with these future trends, um, what the Chamber's role should be in dealing with these future trends, uh, and so forth. So that kind of takes you through the, the steep trends. That's one of the key tools that futurists use to really help people get a clear-eyed view on what's really happening in their community. So the challenge for you would be, you know, in these five categories, what are the trends, the true trends, the data-driven trends that are impacting your community? What are they? And then how can you host a nonpartisan, future-focused discussion about those trends? It's a huge opportunity for chambers, and it helps get people's fears out on the table in a way that is constructive. They can do something with it. So that's part one. Here's the second hack, forecast scenarios. Now all, all that scenarios are are stories. And I, I love, Ed Finn is a brilliant guy at Arizona State University. And he has said, you know, if we want better futures, we need better stories. So I'm gonna ask you to just reflect on this for a minute. What story is your community currently telling itself? What's your community's predominant story? You know, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, where I am right now, where I live, um, our story is that we're this progressive city. You know, we're state capital, the University of Wisconsin here, we're a Big Ten city. And we tell ourselves this story of how progressive we are. And what's interesting about story is that story in a community becomes more important than fact. Because a few years ago, when our race to equity report came out and showed that 80% of white kids graduated from high school and only 40% of brown boys graduated from high school, 
Ooh, Madison didn't want to hear that because it didn't square with the story it tells itself. So you get a sense of how important stories are in a community. Uh, stories are stronger than facts. You know, I'll take a story over, over a statistic any day of the week. And when, when we do scenarios, I mean, we do scenarios of science, but th here would be like a few scenarios you could easily think about for the future of your community. Number one, what if your community did nothing to respond to its current fears? If it just didn't do anything, where would your community end up? What if your worst fears came true? Where would your community be? What if something amazing happened? When the Cubs won the World Series down the street from me a couple years ago, Chicago did not know what to do with itself. It was such good news. They had waited so long for, right? This huge positive disruption happening in this city, right? And pick what your great news is, you know? What would be the positive disruption that could happen in your community? And then play that forward. The point I'm making here is that the reason we do these stories is because it allows us to kind of try on these futures in the same way that I at one point tried this jacket on. How does it fit? What do I like about it? What don't I like about it, right? Using scenarios in our community is very powerful to try on the worst case scenario, to try on doing nothing, all those things. But at the end, what you want is an aspirational story. You might call it a preferred future, but you want a story for your community that is ambitious, that is dynamic, that showcases your community being the best of what it can be. And this might not seem like a big deal, but it is. Because if you, if you can help a community, if you can help your community go from its fearful place to this place of a shared sense that this is where we could be in 10 years' time or this is where we could be in 20 years' time, energy starts to line up in a different way. You see this in your own family. Like some of you were raised in environments where you didn't know you had an opportunity, you didn't know you had the option to not go to college. Like from the time you were little, your parents just said, when you go to college, when you go to college, when you go to college, and what do you know? You ended up going to college, you know? But you weren't consciously trying to go to college necessarily. It's just like your parents kept telling you this story. I've got this, this one group of, this one family that I know, and they have this whole sort of like um, credo of like what their families do. You know, like uh, fill in the name of the family. I'm not going to give it. But like in this family, we don't whine. In this family, we mm -mm. it's like this whole credo. And it's like they tell their kids the story. And my gosh, those kids never have their elbows on the table, you know, and they never whine. And they always say, you know, there are these things that this family does because the story that they tell their kids about what that family means and what that family name means and it's it catches same thing in social systems same same thing in community systems when Ronald Reagan said you know he saw America as the, the city on the hill a powerful powerful image right so whatever your community's current story is how can you change the narrative dial up the narrative make the narrative more ambitious Maybe it was a simple icon or a, a simple couple sets of icons, uh, metaphor stories. Because if you can change your community story, it will live into it. Very often it will live into it. Things start to rearrange. Every, I guarantee you this, every institution in your community wants to be a part of something bigger. Everyone wants to be a part of something bigger. Um, so you create that bigger story and energy starts to follow that attention. Okay, so we're getting on time here. I do have a closing hack, but before I do that, I want to take some of your questions. So um, please populate your questions in the chat box, and I'm going to just kind of keep it dialed in here. Uh, so, all right, I'll give, I'll give that a couple minutes to load up. All right, so I'm, I'll scroll back up through and see if we have any other questions coming in.
All right, Kenja, I'm going to rely on you to um, interrupt me when these come through. Um, it's possible that I'm on a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to I'm going to assume that that's the truth. While you're putting your questions in the chat box here, uh, I want to offer one more hack for you. And I'm looking I'm looking right at you guys who texted that your true fear was about failure. I want to give you a flip. Um, I want to give you a flip that I think will help you uh, think about this. So this is your bonus hack, and here it is. Um, when we think about failure, you know, I'm going to put this on black for just a second. When when we think about failure, what it really is, uh, I feel like I've like been giving a psychology clinic here today, but this is this is the truth of the matter of some of this stuff. So when we worry about failure for ourselves what we're really worried about is our ego dying right or our ego being impacted somehow and what does our ego love our ego loves to feel right or feel good that's basically it um as as i've you know gone through my own journey i've started to think about it like four walls that my ego kind of stays penned in between and those four walls are good and bad right and wrong you know and if my ego wants to feel good and it wants to feel right then somebody else has to be bad or someone else has to be wrong and that's the game your ego is constantly playing with you so if you feel oftentimes like you're the victim right like you've fallen into victim mode or whatever the case is um, that's because you've given you know that you're somehow bad or less than and somebody is better than or whatnot so anyway so a lot of our fear of failure um, is about our ego just trying to protect itself, trying to hang on to itself. So the, the, the hack here is to notice when we're feeling afraid about something and thinking, how can we shift this a little bit? How can we shift this a little bit? So I assembled four of the most common sort of fear statements that I hear around chambers, and I want to give you the flips. So, so here they are. So if you're an exec who thinks, well, only I can do this, right? That's about me. Only I can do this. Only I can you know, have this meeting or host this person or, you know, visit this state representative, ask yourself, who else on my staff could benefit from this? Take it off of me as a savior, right, and put it on to how can this turn into a development opportunity? Second hack here. Man, our chamber doesn't get any credit. We do so much, right, and we don't get any credit. Everybody else takes credit for the work that the chamber does. Well, what if you flip that? And it wasn't about the chamber at all. Instead, it was about what does our community need? that we can execute, right? Again, it's a flip from me and my chamber to me, or to we, and to our community. Third flip, right? Who budgets renewals, you know, are we hanging on the members? How are we gonna end up for year end? This feels like one of the greatest opportunities. It's to say, all right, well, what if we do have fewer revenues? I mean, for most of your chambers, not most of your chambers, I don't know how big the chambers are who are on this call, but in many chambers, there's a person who it's time for them to go anyway, right? So having less revenue might be the reason to, to release that person to their next great adventure or to help that person find their next great adventure. Or maybe you really need to kill 25% of your programming because doing 300 events a year is really dragging your bag, right? So again, a flip from, oh, poor me, to mm, what does this create? What does this open up and make possible? Okay, how about, you know, the EDC and the chamber merged and now they're going to unmerge or they're going to remerge. You know, we're constantly doing this course with our, with our chambers and our EDC groups in many communities. Um, and if you do, maybe it means you're free, you know, to do your next great thing. Um, I can't, I mean, Teepers, when you think about the chamber role, um, you know, you're the, you're the mayors of communities that are, um, that are voluntary. That's a, an, it's an amazing thing, you know. So, uh, yeah, it creates opportunity. And this final thing here, people need to listen to me, right? Well, maybe I actually need to listen, you know. If you feel like you're bumping your head up against the wall all the time, like you're not being listened to, you're not being heard, right, there may be something else at play there. And what would happen if you really listened in a deeper in a deeper way. Okay. So, um, Tenya, I'm coming back to you. Tenya, I'm coming back to you. Yeah, what do you have for yep. questions? 
I have a question. The first one is, can you give a good exa- can you give an example of a good community story? Yes. Um okay, there there are many. Um but I would use uh Charleston, South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, um you know, and for a variety of reasons, you know, um but in in every in every example, so you know, Nashville now is booming. The ACC conference was there two years ago. I think everybody was amazed at the crane factor. But what we don't remember is that in the late 1980s, I think it was, or was it the late 19 late 1990s, the Wall Street Journal basically said Nashville was the armpit of America, and there was nothing going on there. And the leadership in that community was so embarrassed by that that they basically swore an oath and they said before we die, this is going to get turned around. And what you've ended up with in Nashville, and this is a really interesting, Nashville is a really interesting place because, you know, people say, oh, it's a blue bubble in a red state. But the truth is in Nashville, you are never sure whether you're talking to a Republican or a Democrat. I was just there yesterday. And you're never really sure what people's political striations are. And that's really healthy in a community because then things have to get done. And so what Nashville's been able to do is tell a different story. We went from this and this we went to this. And because that future story was so compelling, they had mayors who got behind that and were willing to make big investments. They had businesses and developers uh, come in and be willing to make big investments. And I'll never forget... Um, Janet, oh my God, I can't remember her last name right now, but Janet was the VP of Economic Development, and she was doing something that very few of us uh, have the courage to do. She was very specific about the kind of businesses that she wanted to recruit to Nashville. I'll never forget sitting across from her at dinner. This was over 15 years ago, and she said, we're looking for health care, we're looking for financial, large financial institutions, and we're looking for Fortune 500 headquarters. There may have been one, oh, and of course, and of course, the music industry. She's like, those are the four areas we're going to focus in. And now you look at that today, and you look at the healthcare cluster, the fintech cluster, and the financial services cluster. You, of course, you, you can see how the, the Fortune 500 headquarters that have relocated to Nashville, and then what they've done to support their music industry, 24-7 music across Nashville. So this is a, this is a classic story of the proverbial gun to the head and how a community made the most of it. Now, the truth is, in most communities, um, it is it is unusual for communities to make such a big turn if they don't have a gun to the head. Because, again, people don't like to change. People don't like to change. So if you're in a community, think about this in your community. If you're in a community that people are like, I'm pretty happy with how things are going, right? There's no dissatisfaction. There's no proverbial gun to the head. It might be harder to help change the narrative. It really takes a powerful force to change the narrative. Okay, Rebecca, I have a question from Matthew Myers. Earlier he asked about when you pose that question, what are you afraid of? He specifically mentioned workforce challenges, of course, um, transportation, infrastructure issues. Um, what would you what would you kind of say to that? Yeah, I would say focus on transportation. Um, so you know that I'm a nerd two ways. I'm an economist and I'm a futurist. It's just nerd alert. Well, uh, if you are not following the work of Raj Chetty at Harvard, Raj, R-A-J, Chetty, C-H-E-T-T-Y, you need to do this. Um, there's this award given in economics to a young economist who's doing really cutting-edge work, and Raj won this award a couple years ago. And this is basically like a – this is this award is like a leading indicator of somebody just kicking butt in their career. And Raj has done the most longitudinal, generational work on – you know, if kids are born in certain zip codes, what happens to their economic mobility over time? And I just did a count on this. He's had this one paper he did on the link between transportation and upward mobility has been cited over 1,163 times by other um, academic papers. So this guy, what he has published on this is great. In fact, I'll, I'm writing on my list. I'll add it. So I feel like you know, we talk about affordable housing and we talk about poverty um, and, we, you know, and what we want to do is solve sort of the symptoms of that. Okay, so let's build more, you know, low-income housing or, you know, let's build more senior housing. And affordable housing means different things to different people. It means workforce housing for senior citizens. It means can I afford to live here on a fixed income for 
young professionals, it means what can I rent or own in a really cool urban area. For um, young professionals who are married, starting their family, affordable housing means starter home. So for me, affordable housing, is it just becomes this catch-all phrase that doesn't mean anything anymore because it means so many different things depending on who the person is. But whether you talk about affordable housing, poverty, homelessness, you know, all these things, transportation is the thing that we have to get right. And, you know, looking back 70 years ago, we made a huge bet on cement and interstates. We made a huge bet on that, and we've continued to pour money and money, more money into that. Um, but for many of our communities, more lanes of highway are not the answer, right? A really agile transit system that works um, is the key. And people say, oh, it's such an expensive bet. Well, what's at stake? You know, um, if you want to solve for poverty, generational poverty, if you want to solve for affordable homes, if you want to solve for, um, you know, some of the social ills that we have in our communities, transportation is where I'd focus. I'm kind of passionate about that, sorry. <laughs> Well, Rebecca, thank you so much. I think we just finished with maybe 10 seconds to spare. Whoa, um, look at us. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for participating. And, and thank you, Rebecca Ryan, of course, for this um, extremely informative webinar. We appreciate everything. Thank you, everyone. I will be sure to send a link to the webinar that has been recorded. And everyone, have a great day. Again, Rebecca thank Ryan. You. Thank you. Thank you, Tenta. See you, ATC. We love you guys. Bye-bye. Take care.